the Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I shall be reviewing a personal favourite of mine, and that is the film Waterloo. Yes, okay, I know he has already reviewed it, but I think I can do a decent review of this film. The Napoleonic Wars has been one of my passions for many years, to the point that when I was 13, I took the DVD of this film into school and forced my class to watch it. What are you going to do? Something so very, very painful, so hideous. That you will appreciate this amazing film. I also used to do reenacting until a few years ago, which I enjoyed greatly, with the exception of the oversized gaiters I ended up with. When they said to my mother they were too big, she said, Don't worry, you'll grow into them. I don't know what was worse, the gaiters, or her having my uniform dry cleaned. Fortunately, there isn't any dry cleaning in this film. Released in 1970, it tells the story of the Hundred Days and of the Battle of Waterloo, the last major pitched battle of the Napoleonic Wars. Starring Rod Steiger as Napoleon, Christopher Plummer as Wellington, and a host of other actors. It did not do as well back then when it was released, but now has something of a following as one of the best historical movies ever made, with its large battle scenes and tens of thousands of extras. However, is the film as accurate as it claims? Well, let us find out in this review of Waterloo. As always, I appreciate a good soundtrack, and Waterloo's is brilliant. It was composed by the Italian Nino Rota, and honestly, I could listen to it all day. Now, I must have also apologised to the late Roger Ebert, but I have to disagree with him that the soundtrack of the film was crude, obvious, repetitive, and inappropriately romantic. Honestly, I think that man just hated historical epics in general, given his bad reviews of films like Toro 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 and The Battle of Britain. The film opens in 1814, and we get a very brief introduction to the Napoleonic Wars. It's broadly correct, with the exception of one line that tells us that Napoleon was defeated by a coalition at Leipzig that consisted of Austria, Russia, Prussia, and... England. Now, the first three countries are correct, but the last is a bit of a stretch. Firstly, we are a United Kingdom at this point, so the term Britain really should be used, and secondly, the British contribution at Leipzig consisted of one battery of the rocket troop of the Royal Horse Artillery, numbering no more than 200 men. By contrast, Sweden contributed 25,000 men to this battle. Now, I'm guessing it's meant to be that Napoleon was being beaten by all four of these countries in the war at the time, since Wellington was by this stage driving the French out of Spain, but it is a bit odd to say we held win at Leipzig. It is now the year 1814, and Napoleon is on the verge of defeat. Some of his marshals and generals go to see him to convince him to surrender. There's no hope, sire. We are defeated, sire. For 20 years we followed you. You made a road of glory through Europe. We cannot even save the suburbs of Paris. The Austrians. They're in Versailles. The Cossacks are watering the horses in the sand. They can hear the Prussian cannon in Montmartre. There are four nations, four armies, four fronts against us. Abdicate. Your enemies will allow you to retire to the island of Elba with a personal guard of a thousand men. It is an honourable exile, sire. Now this event is based on truth. Ney, played here by Dan O'Hurley, did lead an effective mutiny of the Napoleon's high command, although Marshal Soult here should not be present since, at the time this meeting happened, he was at Toulouse fighting Wellington. They also missed out the opportunity to include a historical quote of Ney where, when Napoleon said the army would follow him, Ney replied that they would follow their generals instead. Napoleon doesn't take too well to his general's proposals, though. I can't believe my ears. You all stand before me waving a piece of paper, crying, abdicate, abdicate. I will not! I will not! 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 I'm going to talk a bit more about Rod Steiger as Napoleon. Personally, I feel he's a bit too Shakespearean in his portrayal of Napoleon. 
He shouts a lot, he monologues all the time, and I can't really pinpoint it, but there is just something that feels a bit off in his portrayal. I think he was a great actor, don't get me wrong, but I'm not sure if he was the right choice to portray Napoleon on film. I mean, he's not terrible, and he does act well, particularly in the more sympathetic scenes, but I can't really see him as the man who made himself emperor and took over half of Europe. So I suppose that is rather the point. That is not what he used to be at this point in his life. Napoleon soon gets word that Marshal Marmont has surrendered his army to the Austrians, leaving Napoleon with no reserves. He finally agrees to abdicate, and says a last goodbye to the grenadiers of his Imperial Guard. Soldiers! Of my old guard! After 20 years, I have come to say goodbye. France has fallen. So remember me. Though I love you all, I cannot embrace you all. With this kiss, remember me! Goodbye, my soldiers! Goodbye, my sons! Goodbye, my children! pretty decent recreation of his final farewell, although I will point out that the palace they filmed the scene at, the Royal Palace of Caserta in southern Italy, looks nothing like the actual palace of Fontenabla where this scene took place. I don't know why they couldn't just film it at Fontenabla since the actual palace still exists to this day, although since the company that made it was Italian, I suppose they wanted to have some scenes filmed nearby. And so Napoleon leaves for Elba, but within ten months he has escaped and is back from the Napoleonic Wars Part 2 Electric Boogaloo, otherwise known as the Hundred Days. We now go to the Tutelis Palace, which is also the Royal Palace of Caserta again, although I can forgive this one since the Communards burnt down the original. In the palace is King Louis XVIII of France, played by Orson Welles. Your Majesty, the monster has escaped from Elba. We can thank God he's mad enough to land in France. Well, it's not dramatised yet. Napoleon and his followers, the thousand men, they're not really dangerous. Yet. Marshal Salt, you'll keep command of our troops here in Paris. Marshal Ney, you will be the first to confront the werewolf. I know you love this man. I did. Once. But I promise your majesty I'll bring him back to Paris in an iron cage. Now, I have to ask who half the people in this room are. I believe this fellow was meant to be the future Charles X, but I have absolutely no idea who the other two are. Also, keep Ney's line about the iron cage to one side for the moment. We'll get back to that later. Ney now goes to the rest of the opponents at the time of Grenoble. Soldiers of the Fifth. You recognise me. If you want to kill your emperor, <laughs> here I am. Fire! 
Now, I do like the attention to the detail here. The regiment the Royalists sent to arrest Napoleon was the 5th Regiment of the Line. If you look at their shako plates, they bear the fleur de lis and the white cockade of the Bourbons, as opposed to the eagle and tricolour of the Napoleon soldiers, with the number of the regiment on it. Although, once they switched side, the ones at the back seemed to have hurriedly reaffixed the Napoleonic looking cockade and eagles. The events that happen in this scene are pretty true as well, right down to Napoleon's line that... If you want to kill your emperor, here I am. One notable error, though, is the presence of Ney. He wasn't actually at Grenoble. His comment that... But I promise your majesty I'll bring him back to Paris in an iron cage. ...was said by Ney after the incident at Grenoble, when he went with 30,000 men to arrest Napoleon, but instead joined him. Napoleon now arrives back in Paris and greets his enthusiastic supporters. <laughs> Wait a second, is that Grandpa Simpson? Napoleon! Napoleon! Ah, I didn't know he was a supporter of Napoleon. Oh, and I should briefly mention some of the French tunes we hear in the film. The crowd are singing A Sayera as Napoleon steps onto the balcony, which was an old tune from the Revolution, although I'm not sure if Napoleon would have appreciated his lyrics about hanging aristocrats, considering Napoleon had created his own aristocracy. <laughs> A bit later in the film, the crowds later sing this song as the poem turns to the Tutelies. <laughs> this song is known as La Carbagnole, and again dated from the Revolution. Madame Veto avait promis, Madame Veto avait promis de faire égorger tout Paris, de faire égorger tout Paris. The film soundtrack also includes brief reprises of La Marseillaise, although this was not the anthem of France at the time. The song Veillant en Salut de l'Empire was seen more as the anthem of the Empire and was played at Waterloo, although the song Le Chant de Depart, again another old revolution tune, was arguably more popular. Louis now has no choice but to leave France, and again, I have to marvel at the level of detail here. The makers of the film could have just got some basic French soldiers to guard the staircase, but instead they gave them the uniforms of the Gardes de la Porte, a ceremonial unit that dated back to the Middle Ages and had been recreated at the Restoration, along with the Musketeers de Roi, the unit made famous by Alexandre Dumas' novel. They appear to be riding behind the King's carriage. This is the only scene these units are in, but I have to give props to them for going to the length of including the right units. With Napoleon back in charge of France, he writes a flurry of letters all over Europe to try and prevent the Allied nations from declaring war on him. To my dear Prince Alexis. I did not usurp the crown. I found it in the gutter. And I, I picked it up. With my sword. And it was the people, Alexis. The people who put it on my head. He who saves a nation violates no law. To the Prince Regent, England. Your Royal Highness, you've been my most generous enemy for 20 years. But now I want... I want peace. Peace. Some of them are a bit off historically, though. Your son, Ferdinand, was killed when he fell off a horse at a review. Your son was very brave and persistent in his duties. I'm sorry, madam, that fate hasn't been more discriminating. I've no idea who he's talking about, but I don't believe there was a Ferdinand who fell off a horse. The poet also makes mentions of conscription. 
No, 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 no. Musay must go. We need more conscripts. We need more men. We must sweep the area again. Now, whilst he had relied on conscription in the past to get more men into his army, he did not implement it during the Hundred Days, and had to rely on what troops he had and any men who would volunteer, so the film is wrong in stating that he brought conscription back. Not surprisingly, the letter-writing campaign doesn't go too well. Well, they've done it. Declared me an enemy of humanity. All Europe has declared war against me. Not against France, but against me. They dignify you, sire, by making you a nation. <laughs> dignify. Dignify, they deny me the decency of law. They make it legal that any clown can kill me. Yep, quite true. The coalition declared war on the person of Napoleon. At this point, I should talk a bit more about their plan on how to deal with him. Since the war had ended in April 1814, the armies, with the exception of some British regiments in the Netherlands, had all returned home, so when Napoleon returned, the Allies were caught on the back foot. A good chunk of the British army was still in North America, having been fighting in the War of 1812, whilst the Russian and Austrian armies were a good few months' march away. This meant that only a few armies were ready. The Prussians, being nearer to France, amassed about 120,000 men under the command of Marshal Blücher. They were drawn by a mixture of British, Dutch, Belgian and German troops, totalling around 98,000 men commanded by the Duke of Wellington. By July, it was expected that over 200,000 Austrian and 200,000 Russian soldiers would be in position to march across the Rhine, with another 75,000 Austrian and Sardinian soldiers being able to attack from Italy. The Spanish could also field the force of about 80,000 men to attack from across the Pyrenees. Altogether, the Allies could amass a combined force of around 850,000 men to fight Napoleon, given enough time. To counter them, Napoleon had barely 250,000, and many of these had to be split off to garrison the frontier. Nearly 15,000 men were guarding against the Spanish, a little over 5,000 against the Sardinians, about 50,000 along France's western border, and about 20,000 men in reserve, with a force of 10,000 men also being sent to the Vendée region in western France to suppress a royalist revolt. Napoleon was left with only about 120,000 men with which to attack the Allies. However, by June of 1815, only the armies of Wellington and Blücher were in position. Napoleon therefore decided to go on the offensive, and hoped to destroy the two Allied armies in Belgium by concentrating his forces against one and then the other. Now I'm not sure why, but the film has this scene where Soult relays some important information to Napoleon. The armies of Wellington and Blücher have separated, sire. Separated? Yes, sire. Separated? Yes. <laughs> I wonder what history will say of them. <laughs> Thing is, I don't think they ever joined in the first place. Blücher's army had been spread out for a while now, as had Wellington's. They were not sure where Napoleon's attack would come from, but Wellington had assumed a longer route around, so the army was not concentrated. In fact, some of Wellington's brigades were still arriving from America. The 10th Brigade, for example, only arrived at Waterloo on the morning of the battle, having not long disembarked. We now go to Brussels, where the Duchess of Richmond, played by Virginia McKenna, is having a ball in this rather luxurious setting. Historically, it was described as taking place in something that looked more like a barn than a proper ballroom, although I suppose it would look odd from a film point of view to have all these high-ranking officers and ladies dancing around in a room that had been used to store carriages. The Dancing Highlanders here are correct as well, since one of the Duchess's daughters recorded that they danced. Oh, for some reason, the film decided to make up a daughter called Sarah, mainly so she can have a romance with the historical character of Lord Hay, who for some reason is an aide-de-camp to Wellington, when in reality, he was an aide de to General Maitland. Oh, and he was also killed at the Battle of Catra Bra, but the film is generous and he lives to see Waterloo. Well... And think of England! Most of it. We are now introduced to the Duke of Wellington, played by Christopher Plummer. Really are the best of my generals. <laughs> we ladies just have to follow the drum. This season, soldiers are the fashion. Where would society be without my boys? <laughs> They're the salt of England, Arthur. Scum. Nothing but beggars and scoundrels. All of them. Gin is the spirit of their patriotism. Yet you expect them to die for you? Mm-hmm. Out of duty? Mm-hmm. Oh, I doubt if even Bonaparte could draw men to him by duty. Oh, Bonnie's not a gentleman. Arthur, what an Englishman you are. On a field of battle, his hat is worth 50,000 men. But he's not a gentleman. I think he does a decent job, but he again feels a bit too jolly to be Wellington. The Iron Duke was an infantry officer in his younger days and had a reputation of being something of a disciplinarian, 
so I'm not sure if he was this cheery. Although, again, he is at a social event with his social equals, so I suppose we'd be a bit light-hearted. I'm going to talk a bit now about the actors and the accuracy in general. The acting is perfectly fine, but some of the people cast were quite old compared to their historical counterparts, or were made to look older. For example, Michael Wilding was in his late 50s when he made this film, yet the character he plays, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, was only about 42 at the Battle of Waterloo. Some of the other actors are fine with their ages, but are made to look older. Ivo Garani is about the right age for Marshal Soult, who was 46 at the time of the battle, yet he is made to look older, almost like in his mid to late 50s. Granted, this isn't true for everyone. Sergo Sakariaji, who plays Bluka, looks fine, although Sergo was about 60 at the time, whereas Bluka was 72 by the time of Waterloo. Whilst the ball continues, Napoleon sets his plan in motion. Across the river, tomorrow we'll dry our boots in Brussels. God willing, sir. God, God's got nothing to do with it. In the film, we are shown soldiers marching in full battle order, waving their arms about like soldiers do today. This is wrong, since the Napoleonic drill of the era was a bit different to that used today. In most armies, the arms would usually stay at the side as the men marched. The arms swinging didn't really come into drill until much later. Also, generally, soldiers would not march in strict formation when moving across country like this. Since the men are not in battle, they would march rather casually, unless they passed through a town and wanted to impress the local population, in which case they may well form up and get the band out, as happened during the English Civil War, but otherwise they'd be rather casual. Baron von Muffling, the Prussian liaison officer to Wellington, comes with news from Napoleon's advance. By the way, whenever I watch the film My Father, I burst out laughing at this point, since my dad starts doing an impression of John Savident, the actor playing Muffling. His most well-known role was in Coronation Street, where he played the butcher Fred Elliott. Now, whilst Muffling was a pretty important figure, the scene of him telling Wellington about Napoleon's advance is a bit off. This is Napoleon, sir. He has... I'm aware, Muffling. Napoleon has crossed the border. With all his forces. He has come between both our armies. Where? At Chalwa. Chalwa. Do you wish me to stop the ball, Arthur? No, 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 no. I want no alarm. All of us as obliged ladies will finish the dance. Axbridge, move your cavalry immediately towards Charleroi. Picton, your division will march out tonight. Charleroi. According to the Duchess of Richmond's daughter, Wellington was already having supper when the messenger arrived with a message from the Prince of Orange, who handed it to Wellington. Wellington pocketed the message, but read it a short time later and ordered the Prince to return to his headquarters. He was surprised when he returned a bit later with another message, this one from Baron Rebecca, confirming that the French were marching on the Charleroi Brussels Road. He made small talk for about 20 minutes more before saying he was retiring for the night. In reality, though, he went with the Duke of Richmond, who I'm only just noticing is not in the film at all, and laid out his plan. We do get the scene in the film, albeit with a lot more officers present. He should have come by Mons, What could be simpler than Charlotte? He's humbugged me. In a night's march, he's made us piecemeal. I must concede he's gained a victory at the cost of bootlaces. If Marshal Brooker stays in Belgium, I stay too. On that promise, Lord Duke, Blucher would tie his men to trees if necessary. These four roads here. Quatre bras. He's bound to go for them, sir. If we can't hold him there, I'll stop him here. Shall one? By God, that man does war on us. Now we cut to the aftermath of the Battle of Ligny. Field of Glory is never a pretty sight. Nevertheless, 16,000 Prussian dead. That's good news, this slap on the walls of Paris. Wellington's on the run. I caught him at Catabra. He's retreating! If he's retreating, what are you doing here? Well, I came to make my report. If Wellington's retreating, what are you doing here? Why didn't you follow him? Why didn't you pursue him? Where were the reinforcements you promised me? Don't you dare criticize me! Don't you dare! Don't you see if Wellington's free to choose his ground, everything I've won in this campaign, you've lost? Now, this is referring to the whole debacle of Napoleon's first corps of the Grande Armée, commanded by Jean-Baptiste Thoreau, Comte de Law. Napoleon had split his army, massing 60,000 men against Belucas 84,000 at Ligny, whilst Ney was given 20,000 men with which to take the crossroads at Cachabra. The first corps, also about 20,000 strong, was meant to be under Ney's command, 
Napoleon instead ordered it to Ligny to assist in the battle there, without telling Ney. Ney, however, sent orders for the corps to return to him, just before it arrived at Ligny, meaning that it played no role whatsoever in either battle. Had it been committed, it could have led to problems for the Allied armies at Waterloo two days later. We now get to see one of only two scenes featuring Blücher. Marshal Blücher, the sector is broken. I have ordered a retreat. Retreat? I am 72 and a proud soldier. This steel is my word. I am too old to break it. If Wellington runs for the coast, none of us will get home to Berlin. The logical road is Namur. I do not trust the English. Nonetheless, because I have served you before, sir, I have ordered the retreat to Wavre. You may still cooperate with Wellington, but God help us if he does not stand. Pretty much true, although Beluga had just been ridden over by several French cavalrymen, so I don't know what state he was in, although for 72 he was doing pretty well. Some have highlighted that the film does not do a very good job of showing the Prussian contributions to the battle. I've seen talk, though, of a second cut of this film, one much longer, perhaps as long as four hours, which included battle scenes for Ligny and Catra Bra. One scene we can definitely be sure was in this cut was a scene where Blücher meets Wellington outside La Belle Alliance, just after the Waterloo, since a picture of it was featured in the material release at the time the film came out. I expect there was a lot more with the Prussians, but then, sadly, it was cut for the theatrical release and hasn't seen the light of day since. With Blücher in retreat, Napoleon makes a fatal decision. Bouché! Gérard! You take 30,000 men. 30,000 men, one third of my army. You take them in and you pursue, you understand? You pursue Blucher. You don't let them regroup, you don't let them consolidate, and above all, you don't let them rejoin. But there are 10 different ways and directions Blucher might go, sire. Vavre and Namur. Blucher is not a scatter of birds, Marshal Grouchy. We'll find him on one road. Enough's enough! Let's not have any disagreement. Any disagreement will only lead to disaster. Is that understood? Grouchy, Gerard? You can go. Go, go, go. Ultimately, the decision to split his army would prove fatal, as shall be seen later in the film. Wellington, meanwhile, is also retreating with his army, including this regiment. That's mad. It's all madness. They know what they're doing. Look, I keep asking you, if Boney kicked the Prussians in the arse, why are we doing all the running? Now, this is the 27th Enniskillen Regiment. Remember earlier that I said the 10th Brigade only arrived on the morning of the battle? Well, the 27th was part of this brigade, and did not arrive at Waterloo till the actual morning of the battle, so it should not be marching with Wellington here, nor should it be at La Haisante, where this scene happens. Uh, take off your pack, sir. Me, sir? You, sir. Yeah. Open it, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Oh. God! Um, jeez. I... I knew something queer was scratching me back. Sir, you know the penalty for plundering, sir. Uh, stoppage of gin, sir. Damn you, sir, it's death. Sir, I have to report. This this little pig has lost its way, and, and I'm trying to find her relations, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> This fellow knows how to defend a hopeless position. Uh, Raise him to corporal. Yes, sir. Make it a goat next time, Paddy, and you'll be a sergeant. I'm not the first to mention this, but it is all wrong. Wellington, as mentioned, was a disciplinarian, and would be more likely to flog or even hang this soldier rather than promote him to corporal. I also have to mention this regiment as well, and its colonel. I like the cut of your men, Gordon. Ah, damn forward fellas with a bayonet, Wellington. Meat and eggs from the cradle up and a lemon a month. Now, these men belong to the 92nd Gordon Highlanders. In fact, it would appear that some of the actual real-life regiment were sent out to help make this film. I get the impression that this Highlander might have had a role in the extended version of the film, since the film often zooms in on him, but he has no lines, making me think his storyline was cut. Now, it is correct that the 92nd are with Wellington here, since they were part of the 9th Brigade, who suffered some casualties at Catra Bra. The problem, though, is this Colonel Gordon. 
The real life commander of the 92nd during this campaign was Lieutenant Colonel John Cameron, but he was killed at Catra Bra, and command went to Major Donald MacDonald, who was wounded at Waterloo. The rank of full colonel in the British Army was, and to this day remains, an honorary rank. For example, the Duke of Wellington was the colonel of the 33rd Regiment of Foot, but was also a field marshal in the British Army, and so did not command his regiment. The colonel of the 92nd at the time was John Lord Nisery. I have no idea who this Colonel Gordon is, and he is a completely fictional character. General Picton, meanwhile, has reservations about the battlefield. That wood behind us did some sound. If they push us back, it would be like a war. The whole army would be cut to pieces. There's no undergrowth in that wood. You can drive a battery of nine-pounders. A whole army can slip through it like rain through a grate. It's suicidal, if you want to know. It may surprise you to know, Picton, that I saw this ground a year ago. And I've kept it in my pocket. One thing I love about this film is that they will often use quotes actually said by these characters. For example, Napoleon says this. Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. That's bad manners, eh? <laughs> He actually said this before the Battle of Austerlitz rather than Waterloo, but the comment is one you could almost imagine the Napoleon saying before Waterloo. Wellington, meanwhile, is with his officers, deciding if he can fight the next day. You may fight your battle, Field Marshal. You may fight your battle. Where is Grouchy? And his 30,000 men. Grouchy is following us, step by step. He's not between us. What's the time, hey? I think it's after two, Your Grace. It's ten to two, sir. Muffling, I must ask you to go out once more tonight. Oblige me with a fresh horse, sir. I beg! Marshal Blucher to come to Waterloo by one o'clock. Don't you see, Uxbridge? Now if... If Grouchy turns and comes between us... And catches a Prussian strung out on the march. Then it would be just a matter of counting our dead. With such a risk, dare we rely on Blucher? We have to rely on each other, Uxbridge. Again, it is good we get this scene, and it shows pretty much how the whole battle was a holding operation to give enough time for forces to be concentrated to beat Napoleon. I will question, though, why the fictional Colonel Gordon is at this meeting, when he only commands a battalion, whilst there is no sign of Lord Hill and the Prince of Orange, Wellington's main corps commanders at Waterloo. It would be like having a meeting for the Normandy landings, but replacing Monty with some random battalion commander. On the other side of the battlefield, Napoleon is having some health issues. Should I send for Dr. Loray? Should I call the doctor? <laughs> No, 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 doctor. This will become important when the battle itself happens, so I'll discuss it more then. In the meantime, again, I cannot stress just how beautiful the soundtrack and filming is. And so, as the sun rises on the morning of the 18th of June, 1815, I will end part one of my review. Part two will look at the battle itself, and whether or not the film deserves its reputation for accuracy. In the meantime, thank you for watching. This has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.